So down in this part of the factory are where the firm installed their drop stamps, or kick stamps they're called. And these are the heavy duty machines which would stamp out either the larger components or the components where you needed to stamp a much deeper impression into the sheet of gold. And the chap who operated these was that fella called Arthur Brewer that I mentioned who looked after the dies and punches. This was his principal role in the firm and he was here doing this for 60 years. So the workforce affectionately called this part of the factory Arthur's Pit. Uh, he was the machine tech for the firm, so that meant that when a particular design needed stamping out, either with the drop stamps or the fly presses, which I'll show you next, he would come along and he would fit the die in here, and then held at the bottom of the weight is the punch. Now, just to confuse you, in this instance, the punch is called something else, it's called a force, and it's made of brass instead of st uh, steel, sorry. So, what you do is you pop your gold on top of the die, and um, what I'll do now is I'll turn on this electric motor, which they install to help him. They install this electrical motor. It takes half the weight out of lifting the thing. They were getting a bit concerned about him, the bosses were. But uh, as soon as he saw it, he wasn't keen on it. He felt with that electric motor taking the effort out of the job, anyone could now do his job. So he wasn't at all happy about it. But anyway, um, yeah, so we'll get that motor going now and I'll stamp one of these out so you can see the incredible detail that these machines produce. So that's the whirring noise of the friction drive and your initial drop is just a lighter tap to bed the metal down. It wouldn't always be advisable to do this in one drop because you could um, potentially crack the metal. Then your working drop is roughly from about head height and this will give uh, the uh, weight enough force to stamp all of the detail of the die into the sheet of gold. So here we go. I'll give you a countdown because these are relatively loud if you want to cover your ears. So I'll do it in three, two, one. Now, um, he was producing somewhere around 8 to 12 a minute on this one here. He was doing this job for 60 years, so he did have a degree of deafness and a bad back at the end of all that. But what we have here is the Athena medallion. I'll bring it up so you can have a look at it, uh, just exactly how much detail gets stamped into the plain sheet of gold. So the next part of the process would be to take the edging here and uh, remove it and instead of these going over to the mounters bench uh, to be sawn, to have the excess sawn off, um, they would be brought over to the fly presses, these are called fly presses, and the two girls Valerie and Marjorie uh, would stamp out the excess um, in the fly press here. So uh, that would go in between this set of dies and punches which are specifically uh, called blanking dies and punches so that's between the dies and punches and in one foul swoop it takes off the edging your excess is here and at the end of the day mr tom will put that into the furnace for another melt and down in the drawer below the machine are the pieces which we've just done now, depending what the order was, these could either be pe uh, pendants, lockets, or brooches. So the good thing about this set of dies and punches is, and the reason why they're called blanking dies and punches is, this will now stamp out exactly the right size of disc to be used as the backing. So the Athena medallion and the backing would then go over to the mounters benches. They're building up the body or the mount of the jewellery. And these two pieces would be soldered together. And then onto the back, you'd solder whatever kind of pin or clasp you needed to fasten it to your top. So that would be your brooch. Um, this was considered unskilled work. The apprentices uh, on the benches there, for skilled work, as I mentioned before, they were given a seven year apprenticeship, but it would be typical with this unskilled work here for the trainee to be given one and a half weeks training, and that would be the full training. But both of these two work very swiftly and very accurately. They had a method of knocking these machines on, using the forearm like that, and 
when it came to producing things such as uh, these, um, they'd be knocking the machine along as I showed you, but they'd be placing the metal so uh, perfectly that they would interlock the designs and get the maximum number from the one sheet. And both these two went on perfectly like that year after year, but both of them at one point had the tiniest lapse of concentration. And when you use machinery like this, uh, it meant that both of the two of them had chopped the tops of their fingers off. And that was a relatively common sight you'd see in the quarter, because not only was the jewellery quarter, just before the First World War, the largest trade in any city in the world, but it was also the world capital for producing steel pen nibs that you dipped in the ink and you wrote with them. And it was said a girl of average industry in the pen nib factories using these machines could stamp out 28,000 pen nibs a day. And that's uh, in a 10 hour shift. And they had to reach at least 16,000 something. So there was a lot of press work in the jewelry quarter for producing component pieces for jewelry, but lots of press work for producing pen nibs. And um, they were considered unskilled, um, but it was written of the Birmingham jeweller. They were fiercely independent artisans, and nine, it would be usual for nine out of ten workers in a Birmingham jewellery firm to think, oh, I've got this bit of training behind me, I could quite easily do that for myself. So nine out of ten workers would go off and start their own firms. Uh, so, uh, once the components have gone across uh, to be assembled by being soldered together, um, a tarnish would build upon the jewellery under the heat of the Bunsen burner. So to get rid of that tarnish, the articles would come across to uh, the completely airtight pickling tank and they'd be lowered into a solution uh, called Aki Waters, which was a mild acidic solution. And that would sort of take just several microns of the surface of the jewellery away, including the tarnish. And then eventually the things would come across to the polishers, which I'll show you just in a minute. On this side of the factory, this long range here is the uh, polishing and lapping range. And it's where Big Edie, Little Edie and Anna Foster would be polishing the jewellery. And we know from some of the former employees that um, these three got on fantastically. There'd be lots of laughter and banter going on here. And it was said that they looked really healthy because their cheeks were ruddy, uh, ruddy red. But a lot of it was down to the fact that still to this day, one of the best things to polish gold jewellery with is this stuff called Jewellers Rouge. And basically, um, the pieces of jewellery would come down through grades of, a, uh, of an abrasive that would be applied to it. And then sort of the end of the process was the Jewellers Rouge, Rouge, which is a light abrasive. And it's this that brings this final really fulsome shine up in the jewellery. Um, now these two, uh, these three, sorry, um, they work very swiftly in and out of every face of the jewellery. Their hands were almost a blur. And it would be very usual to find sort of ladies on the polishing machines whose fingers were also, were also very smooth at the end, sort of from constant uh, years and years and years of sort of having them polish themselves, the, the fingertips almost. And what we can do now is we can turn on both the belt drives of some of the polishing machines over there, but also you see these grids here these are the tops of a, a dust extraction system that the firm installed and this was very sensible because otherwise gold dust would fly off into the atmosphere uh, so these are the openings for the uh, dust extraction system which draws gold dust down into 12 massive vacuum bags in the cellar which would eventually would be emptied into the furnace so um, what I'll do now is I'll go and first turn on the dust extractors and then I'll turn on the belt drives over here and this will give you a feel for how loud things were in here. This would just be a couple of the layers of noise that were going on. So we've seen a couple of the processes downstairs. We've seen how the jewellers, both the skilled workers, the semi-skilled and the unskilled workers were manufacturing the firm's jewellery. So it's about time to show you the bosses that ran the place. So the firm was founded by Charles Smith and his uncle in 1899. Then Charles Smith and his wife Agnes went on to have a mere nine children. And taken over from Charles when he retired in 1930 were the two brothers, Eric and Tom, and the daughter, Olive. 
They all had their own distinct roles within the firm. Eric was the salesman and he was the outright boss. Olive was the company secretary and Tom was in charge of manufacturing. And they were very well regarded by the workforce. We were very lucky in that we managed to interview lots and lots of the former employees for this project. And they said, yeah, these three, they were fair bosses. They were very hard working bosses, but they were a kind bunch of people to work for. And we got story after story of the nice things they did for the workforce. And to all intents and purposes, this was a happy firm to work in. We've got um, Big ED, Little ED and Anna Foster over here polishing. They were very happy. Glenda, one of the office workers, said she'd go down into the factory and there'd always be laughter and banter going on between these three. And it was a, a good firm to work in. The skilled work, that was good paid work. The unskilled work wasn't good paid work, but account after account that I've heard about people working in the Birmingham trade is that it was a nice job anyway. So this was one of the medium to large scale employers with around 45 people in the firm compared to hundreds of tiny specialist firms dotted around the jewellery quarter. But all in all, it made this uh, the one time largest single centre of precious metal working in the world. It's still the largest collection of manufacturers and retailers in Europe. It produces around 40% of Britain's jewellery as a whole, but most of Britain's gold jewellery. And I've only given you a tiny, tiny brief introduction into this particular company, but there are so very many stories, both of the manufacturing side of things, but the human stories of the workforce who worked here. They told us so much. It really is a very, it's an inspiration, and we heartily recommend that you come and see us um, soon. Mm -hmm.